quantum computers are able to do that math like super fast and super effectively in a way that you know an, an ordinary classical computer would struggle with. Hey y'all and welcome back to the FAQ podcast. My name is Ty Danae Bradley and I am here again with Adam Green. And before we get started, I just wanted to say to all of our listeners, thank you so much for all of the comments you guys have left us uh, on YouTube. We really appreciate hearing from you. So on that note, if there are other topics that we haven't discussed yet on the podcast that you would like to hear, please feel free to let us know. Either send us an email, we have it down in the description below, or leave us a comment. Um, so what's on the agenda for today? Well, last time we made an effort to kind of move away from theory and abstract concepts in the quantum AI space. And today we're going to pick up the trend of moving from there to, to applications. So last time we chatted about quantum sensing, and today we want to move to quantum computing. That's right, Ty Danae. Very excited that we're continuing this trend and um, happy to be talking about quantum computing today. It's something that a lot of people initially think of when they think about yeah. uh, quantum technology. So I'm yeah. glad we'll be able to get into that a little bit today. And specifically with quantum computing, we're going to talk about the impacts that that could have on um, cryptography, uh, basically how quantum computers could affect data privacy, data security, um, and everything that we use to communicate with the uh, through the internet. So very happy that we uh, have our returning guest, our VP of engineering from Sandbox AQ, Stefan Leichenhauer, uh, back on the show. Stefan, Welcome, and it's great to see you again. And let's just jump right into it. I hope that maybe you can give a little bit of an overview of what cryptography actually is, um, how that influences data privacy and security, and then importantly, how quantum computing might throw a wrench into that whole system. Um, so I'll hand it off to you, Stefan. Great. Well, thanks for having me back. Very happy to be here. So first of all, it's a very complicated uh, complicated area. There are lots of moving parts, and it's, you know, it's very, we're not going to get into all the nitty gritty today, even if we zoom in on the part where quantum computers will have the most impact, which is on uh, the cryptography side. So by cryptography, I mean uh, the following. So if you want to send a message, maybe it's like your credit card number, for example, or some other kind of sensitive data, you don't want to transmit that over the internet in plain text where anybody can read it. You, you want your sensitive information to be somehow encoded in a way that is not easily readable by, you know, some, some thief who wants to, who can maybe tap the signal and, or intercept the signal and, and uh, find out your information. You want to encode it somehow, and then the, the intended receiver will be able to decode it and get the message. Okay. And that's, doing that is what cryptography is about. And uh, there are several popular methods of doing cryptography these days. Um, the ones that are most relevant for this discussion are the uh, so-called public key cryptography um, methods. So things like RSA, which is a well-known uh, cryptography method going back quite a ways. And these methods um, use, you know, they use math in the background in order to do this kind of encoding and decoding step. And the, the problem is that the math that they use is uh, it's the quantum computers are able to do that math like super fast and super effectively in a way that you know an, an ordinary classical computer would struggle with, and that's the basic idea behind why the the discussion is relevant. So maybe we could chat a little bit about that math. I mean, we don't want to scare folks away, but um, I think it's actually somewhat accessible in the sense that the math behind RSA really involves a special kind of arithmetic um, and nothing yeah. too nothing too much more. I mean, maybe, it, can, can we chat about that a little bit? So RSA, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Yeah, yeah, let's chat about it. I think it's it, it pays off, I think, to go one level deeper for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's interesting, but two, it's also like worth noting that the very particular details of how RSA works are why quantum computers are especially effective against RSA. Quantum computers, you know, in general, will not do everything super fast, right? It's a it's a particular problem that RSA has and other kinds of cryptography that we happen to be using, uh, and it has to do with the details of how they work. 
So yeah, so the the so Ty, the the arithmetic you're referring to is modular arithmetic, which is a really interesting sort of arithmetic. It's it's one that um, you know everybody is familiar with, even though they they don't realize it. Uh, this is this is the the arithmetic that we use all the time uh, with clocks, with telling time during the day, right? When we we uh, we tell the time, we say it's one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, etc. And then by the when we get to twelve o'clock, the next the next hour after that is one o'clock again. So it kind of goes in a circle. It's cyclic. And so if you wanted to add, you know, uh, thirteen hours to two o'clock, well. You would say, I go 12 hours to get, get me, gets me back to two o'clock, maybe switching from AM to PM. And then one more hour to make 13 gives me three o'clock. So the, this is an example of modular arithmetic. It's sort of doing addition, but with the, with the extra property that you, um, you kind of repeat yourself every once in a while. And so, yeah, so it, there, just, yeah. to, just to be yeah. explicit, two plus 13 equals three is what you're saying. Exactly. At least if we're talking about modulo 12. Modulo right? 12. Okay. Modulo 12. Two because, plus 13. E yeah. Go ahead. Exactly. So 2 plus 13, or 2 plus 13 is 15 ordinarily, and 15 is 3 more than a multiple of 12. In this case, 12 times 1, which is just 12. And so we say that uh, 15 is equal to three modulo 12 because it's three more than a multiple of 12. And so that's, that's the basic idea of modular arithmetic is that you do ordinary arithmetic. You can think of it this way. You do ordinary arithmetic using the ordinary numbers. And then at the end, you look at how far away you are from a multiple of the number that you're, you know, that you're doing modulo by. And then that's, that's the final answer is is uh is that that difference okay so yeah. the, so in the clock example of a modular is it modular or modulo we How say uh mo modulo is sort of like a verb that we use <laughs> like modulo 12 i don't know well maybe it's not a verb but anyway modulo okay. modulo 12 is the, or okay. modulo n uh is okay. how we do it but but it's modular arithmetic Okay. Okay. So modular arithmetic. In this case, the clock example, the modulus or modulo is 12. Modulus, so, I think is the modulus. Word, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the modulus is 12 because you're going around that, yeah. around the clock. So uh, you said this is kind of like the basics or the one of the fundamental pieces of RSA. So how That's does right. that modular uh, arithmetic get connected to this thing that like secures everything from like healthcare records to finance and everything else? Yeah, yeah. So the idea behind RSA is to do modular arithmetic, but not with 12, but with a really big number. So a number that may have more than 100 digits. So RSA 2048, for example, is, is doing modular arithmetic with a modulus that has 2048 uh, binary uh, digits to it. So uh, 2048 bits, which is, I believe, hundreds of ordinary digits. So a really big number. Um, and so if you imagine it's a, if you imagine it as a clock, instead of, you know, 12 hours, you would have a really large number of, of ticks on the clock. Right. And now the, the modular arithmetic, the, the arithmetic we're going to do is not addition, uh, or subtraction or multiplication even, but exponentiation. So if you take, uh, you know, something like, if you take a number and then square it and cube it or raise it to the fourth power or fifth power, that's what I mean by exponentiation. And then look at the, uh, look at the, um, the remainder modulo, this very large number. So we're doing very large numbers. We're taking a large numbers. We're raising them to very large powers. And then we're uh, doing that modulo some very large number. Uh, so that's the basic ingredient. That's the that's the that's the arithmetic that's involved. And here's a summary of how it works. So the message that you're trying to send me is one of these, say, ticks on the clock. Like it's it's a it's a number. So the 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 minute hand or whatever can be in one of a very large number of places. And you want to send me you want to send me a message which is one of those places. And so the way you're going to encode your message 
is you're going to take the number that your message corresponds to and you're going to raise it to a particular power. And uh, the, the power that you're going to raise it to is, um, you know, some potentially other very large number. And what this looks like, you know, if you, if you raise a number to a power, the number can get, end up being very large. And so if we know we're doing modular arithmetic, if we think of this clock, the minute hand, we can think of it as spinning around a very large number of times, potentially, and then landing in some random spot, who knows where. Um, and if all you had was, was that, you would not be able to know what the original message is unless you had uh, sort of a secret key which let you undo that kind of spinning step. And the secret key, say you pass your, you pass your encoded message to me, and what I do is I do modular exponentiation again. I have in my possession another number that I, you know, that acts as the exponent where I take the thing that you sent me and I do modular exponentiation. And so maybe spinning around the clock another large number of times. And it just so happens that the relation between your exponent that you used and the exponent that I used are such that when, when my exponentiation is finished, it lands exactly where your original message was. And, and that's, the, that's the magic. So the, the trick here is figuring out what exponents to use that have these kinds of properties. What are the exponents? And the reason why it works for encryption is that if you know, say, the, the number, you know, the number of, of ticks on the clock, so the, the modulus, and you know one of the exponents, say the one that you use to encode the message, it's very hard for you to figure out what the other exponent is. The one that, uh, or it's, 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 uh, it's, it, it can be very hard for you to figure out what the other exponent is. And so figuring out what that other exponent is, the fact that that's hard to do means that it's difficult to decode this message. It just so happens, you know, like we were sort of phrasing things in this language of modular exponentiation and things like that. It just so happens that the difficulty of figuring out the other exponent is tied to the difficulty of factoring the modulus. This is something people always, people always talk about RSA being secure because it's hard to factor numbers. Um, the number, the modulus that we started with is constructed to be a product of two large prime numbers and figuring out this, you know, these sort of exponents or the, the sort of the second exponent turns out for reasons that we, I don't think we'll have time to go into here, turns out to be uh, equivalent to being able to factor that modulus into the two primes. Interesting. So the, so the two exponents are not factors. Like if you're, if That's right. when you hear about these things about like you need to factorize, you know, or RSA in order to break it, you need to be able to factor large numbers. Like the, the first thing that I thought about when I first heard that was like, oh, it's those exponents. Like, you know, you get those two exponents, you know the things, and then you can figure everything else out. But what you're, what you're telling me is that you actually need to factorize the, the modulus. Is that, is that the other missing That's piece? right. That's right. That's right. So the, the, okay. the modulus, the factors of the modulus, and this thing about the exponents, these are equivalent pieces of information. So like if you knew how to factor the modulus, you could figure out this, this um, uh, you could figure out the other exponent pretty easily and vice versa. If you knew the, uh, if you knew both exponents, you could use that information to factor the original number. So factoring numbers is something that's easier to talk about. It's something that people are more familiar with. So that's how we talk about it. But um, it's actually a really interesting, you know, sort of number theory discussion we could have about the relation between factoring numbers and this sort of uh, periodicity of modular arithmetic and things like that. It's uh, it's a it's a fascinating fascinating subject, um, but that's yeah. that's the basic story. 
Okay. No, that, and that sounds like a nice mathematical topic too, that I, I know Ty Dene would love to have that conversation with you. So once again, we'll add it to the list, Stefan, of things to try to bring you back on to, uh, to talk about. One more question that I have for this before we get into the, the quantum computing side of like, okay, so we kind of know the basics. How does quantum computing change the, the dynamics of the field? But before we get into that, you were talking about this like secret message is, you know, analogous to maybe one spot on the clock. Yeah. Uh, like when I think about that, the first thing that comes into my mind is if your message is a string of, of bits or a string of information, do, does each bit need to be like on that, on that clock face or is it one entire message? You only have to run this once for, to decode a message or do you have to rerun this like RSA decryption to decrypt on a byte by byte basis, everything within the message? Does that, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. And I suppose one answer is that, it's kind of up to you. Uh, basically, certainly you could use RSA to send the whole message as long as it's, you know, it sort of fits on the clock, so to speak. Um, you could use it to send, uh, you know, p pieces of the message. You could, you know, if you wanted to, you could chop the message up into pieces, whether they're bytes or something else, and then send each of those. There are lots of options you have. Typically, actually, what... Um, people use RSA for in practice most of the time is not to send, say, you know, the intended message at all. Like if I wanted to send you the contents of a book, I would not encode the whole contents of the book in RSA. Typically what I would do is I would encode the contents of the book using a different encryption scheme, something called a symmetric encryption scheme, that is a little bit simpler, but requires that you and I have a shared secret. So something that we did not discuss in the context of RSA is that you can do, the, the thing that makes RSA really powerful is that the people who are exchanging messages don't have to have set up some kind of shared secret knowledge beforehand. That's, the, that's why it's called a public key encryption scheme. Um, but usually what people use RSA to do is to set up that shared secret that you can use for a different encryption scheme, sometimes called a symmetric key encryption scheme, um, and then use that to send, say, the real message. Gotcha. So yeah, so you're using RSA to get that get that nugget or that primer, that key that then unlocks the thing that's maybe a little bit easier exactly. um, to use. Okay, so you're using exactly. RSA for the hard part and then getting that handshake. And then yeah, just for the trust. initial, just to set up the initial, say, secured communication channel, so to speak. Gotcha. All right. So how, do, how does quantum computing mess all that up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the um, quantum computing, really, this is one of the big uh, instigators of the, the, uh, the attention that quantum computing has gotten over the last 30 or so years. Um, and it's because in the, in the mid-90s, uh, Peter Shore figured out how to sort of solve this, well, usually it said solve this factoring problem. Uh, using quantum computers. Really, actually, uh, just like an RSA, it's easier to, or the way RSA is actually used has to do with this modular exponentiation and the sort of periodicity of the modular exponentiation, you know, coming back around to yourself. Um, Shor's algorithm for, uh, for cracking RSA actually directly is attacking that aspect of the problem. So really what Shor's algorithm is about is it's about figuring out how this modular exponentiation, which sort of turns you around on the face of the clock in a particular way, it, it, Shor's algorithm is about figuring out how to come back to yourself under this modular exponentiation operation. It's really about finding the period of this, of this operation. So if I, if I gave you a number, so you've got your modulus, and now let's pick another number, which maybe is the message, but let's just call it some other number. And you start raising that num you start raising that number to different powers. Square it, cube it, raise it to the fourth power, fifth power, modulo uh, your chosen modulus. Eventually, after a while, you'll come back to yourself. Uh, it'll come back to the number it started in. And the problem the problem that's very important for RSA is figuring out what power to raise it to so that it eventually comes back to itself. And Shor's algorithm finds that power. It finds what the power is that uh, you have to raise a number to so that it comes back to itself. 
And that lets you, and that is connected to factoring. Um, and that's connected it, uh, it to factoring the modulus as well. Can you say in a nutshell where the quantum part comes into yeah. Shor's algorithm? Yeah, yeah. So most of Shor's algorithm actually is, uh, is not really quantum. Uh, if you think of Shor's algorithm as, a, as, a, as an algorithm for factoring, for factoring numbers, um, a lot of it is setting up this, you know, you know the, the translation between factoring numbers and doing this modular arithmetic, and then uh, going from learning about this particular periodicity to factoring the numbers, which tells you other general information. But really, the the there's kind of a, a general feature of quantum mechanics, which is that quantum mechanics, um, in many instances, really lets you understand periodic behavior. Okay, and things that happen, you know, in, you know, that repeat themselves over and over again. And the thing that quantum mechanics lets you do that ordinary classical mechanics or that classical computing can't let you do is it lets you get information about how often things repeat or the, the periodic nature of things uh, without knowing about what values those things take on, right? So in the, in the classical world, Basically, more or less, your best bet on finding this period is just taking your number and raising it to successive powers and just seeing when does it repeat itself. Um, you just, you, and in the, in the process, you learn a bunch of information you didn't care about. You learn what the number squared is, and you learn what its cube is, and you learn its fourth power. You don't actually care about any of that information, but you kind of pick it up along the way. Uh, in quantum computing, what quantum computing lets you do is it has native to quantum computing is an operation which lets you take a shortcut straight to knowing what the period is. But without getting all of that, you know, information you didn't care about, you, you sort of don't learn any of that along the way. You don't learn what the square is or the cube or anything like that. You just know, well, if you raise it to this power, you'll come back to where you started. Um, and jumping straight to that periodicity information is a thing that quantum mechanics does all the time over and over again. Uh, this is in, in a more physics kind of language, we would, talk about, uh, we would talk about things like the particle position and the particle momentum. And this is sort of like, if, if sort of the, the, position of, the position is like your place on the clock as you're sort of spinning around, and then the periodicity is sort of like looking at that situation from the momentum perspective. And so going, shifting perspective from position to momentum for those physicists in the audience is kind of like the perspective shift that we're doing here. Okay. I think that's like Fourier transform or something. Exactly. Exactly. Fourier transform. And in fact, the, the key, you know, ingredient in the algorithm that makes it work is the quantum Fourier transform mm -hmm. and the quantum Fourier transform lets you, lets you do this in a way that's, you know, cheaper uh, computationally than the, non-quantum Fourier transform. You could do a classical version of Shor's algorithm using the ordinary Fourier transform. It just would not be, it would just take a long time. What's a long time? So like, this is what I wanted to get into, Stefan, is that like, it sounds like that you can do that and you get the, the, the public number, you can square it, cube it to the fourth or the fifth, and you're gathering all this information. Maybe you put that into a table, you're looking to see when yep. it comes back on itself. And when it comes back on itself, like jackpot, you've got the other number that will help you factor yep. the modulus or something like that. So what kind of difference or speed up, like how long does that take with a 2048-bit modulus? Yeah. No, that's a great, that's a great question. what kind of acceleration do you get? That's a great question. So let's imagine we were trying to make this table. We take the number, so it's a position on the clock face, and we square it, and that gives us a new position on the clock face. And then we cube it, and we take a you know, fourth power and so on. And so we're kind of just jumping around this clock face. And then eventually we'll get back to where, uh, to where we started. But how many jumps around the clock face is it going to take? Well, uh, your first thought might be, well, there are a number of possible positions on the clock face um, that are uh, you know, equal to the, the modulus. So I, maybe I have to jump around a number of times equal to the modulus. And if the modulus is a 2048-bit number, that's a very large number of times you have to do an operation. It's not quite that bad, um, you know, because there are certain shortcuts you can take, but 
more or less, if you want to get an idea of the size, the size, the, the, the number of operations that you're going to have to do, even in the, in the, uh, you know, even if you try and use as many shortcuts as you can and take advantage of the structure of the problem, you know, it's not quite the same as the, the number of tries is not quite the same as like the size of the modulus, but it's, you know, in, in that ballpark, at least roughly speaking, maybe with an asterisk on that statement. However, so, yeah. Yeah, with a quantum algorithm, the number of steps that you'll need, the, the, num the, the number of operations, quantum operations you need to do to solve this problem does not, go, does not you know, ballpark the size of the modulus. It's ballpark the number of digits in the modulus. And so, or the number of bits in the modulus. So instead of being the size of this 2048 bit number, it's just like 2048 or maybe that, maybe 2048 cubed or something like that. But it's, it depends on the number of bits, not the number itself. Okay. So that's a big difference. Yeah. So can we put that, like, if you were to try to put that into some kind of like practical terms, we're thinking, we, I, I guess I don't know how many digits a 2048 bit number is, but let's call it a couple of hundred. So yeah. if it's a, a couple of like a number that's a couple of hundred digits long, if you were to do this in a classical way, that's approximately the number of times you'd have to do this, this uh, operation of cubing and to the fourth and, and all of that. Like, uh, is that, is, is that minutes? Is that hours? Is that years? Like how long would it take a classical computer like your laptop yeah. to, to break So, it? I mean, you know, even if you used all the shortcuts possible, mm -hmm. it would not, you would not have to go to a very large, like a super large number before we're talking age of the universe. Um, wow. It's, 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 uh, I mean, just a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 it's really, it's really bad every time. And if 2048 is not enough, you can just add more bits. And every time you add a bit, you just add a huge amount to the, to the, to the time that it takes. Okay. Cause this is kind of coming, coming into my mind now because it wasn't always 2048. It was like, you know, uh, the, the next number down from that, is that like 1056 or, or like, yeah, the, and then we just increase, increase that. So, okay. That's so right. This is that's like, right. So, okay. so, so, I mean, you don't want to use the more bits that you use, the more annoying it is to do the encoding and decoding and things like that. So you want to, I mean, that's why, you know, the, the numbers started small. And so over time, you know, if you use too small of a, of a, of a, of a, uh, of a modulus, it, you know, you, then you could do it on a laptop. Um, and maybe if we put in all the bells and whistles, it would not take the age of the universe to, to crack 2048. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's, it's, the behavior is essentially exponential in the number of bits. So it doesn't take, you don't have to add too many bits before you start crossing the threshold of just being impossible. Okay. And, and what about on the, the sh using shores on a quantum computer, um, less than the age of the universe, I'm guessing. To, to yeah. Yeah. So, so shores on a quantum computer, you know, it, there are, it depends on the quantum computer, obviously, but, um, it could, it could be, it could be hours or something along those lines. Um, hours, perhaps days, even if it, you know, even if it ends up being longer than that, but still something that's doable, that makes a big difference because you, you, you know, you, what you want is you want these things to be secure ideally forever, but certainly for very long amounts of time, longer than, you know, typical times that humans care about so many years. And with a, with a quantum computer, it could be, uh, that just goes out the window. Gotcha. And are, we're not there right now, I'm guessing, or else we'd be having a very different discussion. So like, is, is this, is this something we should be worried about? Who should be worried about this? What is the time frame to be worried about this? Yeah. So that's an interest. That's actually a very interesting question. So some people should be worried right now, even though the quantum computer that can do this cracking does not exist, uh, today, as we were just saying, the kind of security that you're often after in, in many contexts is security that lasts many years, right? So if a quantum computer is constructed that can crack, say, RSA 2048 10 years from now, let's say that happens 10 years from now, that means the data that exists today will become free and open to the public in 10 years um, because somebody can take the data, 
knowing that it's encoded and they, they won't be able to crack it on their laptop or their supercomputer, but they're just going to hold it until they have the quantum computer 10 years from now. And then, then they'll, uh, then they'll, then, then they'll crack it. And so people who care about long-term data security. So for example, financial institutions or governments, national security related information, um, or very important proprietary information from companies, enterprises, these kinds of people should care a lot right now. Uh, because of what I just mentioned, if you you know if you're sending you know silly text messages to your friends, maybe it's not a big deal for those things to um, for the for that particular uh, use case to uh, remain safe for ten more years. But um, it's that's that's really the question that you that you have to have in mind. Yeah, and this is such a thing. I mean, for those folks that are sending something more secret than a silly te text message. I mean, it's like a thing now. And I think that nefarious attack even has a name store now decrypt later. I mean, yeah. it's like a real thing right now, right? It is a real thing and it is, and it is happening. And there are a lot of people who care a lot about it. Um, the good news is there are things you can do. It's not like a lost cause. Uh, you know, as, as we were discussing the fact that a quantum computer can solve this RSA problem has very much to do with the details of RSA and how RSA works and, you know, this sort of modular exponentiation and those kinds of things. And there are other problems, other math problems, you know, not factorization or not modular exponentiation, other math problems that you could have used as your basis of cryptography that for perhaps historical reasons, we chose not to use, we use RSA instead. Um, but you could have used some other set of problems, some other set of math problems as your basis of public key cryptography. And not all of them are susceptible to quantum attacks. And uh, so a collection of those things are right now being standardized into new cryptography standards that we can all use um, and will use. And that's the, that's the sort of this post quantum cryptography it's called. And there's this post quantum cryptography um, uh, process standardization process that's being run by uh, in the U.S. by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, to standardize a new set of algorithms that are strongly believed to not be susceptible uh, to quantum attacks, and we can use those instead of RSA. Gotcha. So in some ways, we're like I was about to ask you why are we in this mess. I think you kind of just answered that that it's. For one reason or another, we decided, or the, the folks that were in charge of this decided a long time ago that uh, we're going to use this thing called RSA. Seems good, seems secure. If they would yeah. have picked something else, then perhaps we would be in a very different situation. But That's that right. has per permeated the, the internet and, and digital commerce has been permeated by RSA. So now we have to deal with that historical decision. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And that, you know, And it was not like a bad decision to use RSA. Uh, by any means, you know, it's, it's stood the test of time actually quite well. Um, you know, going, you know, it, it traces its roots back to the seventies. So, uh, we're coming up on 50 years of, of RSA, which is actually, it's actually very impressive that it lasted as long as it did. Um, and, uh, and it, and it functions really well. It's just sort of secure and performant, right? The, the post quantum cryptography algorithms, they're, they're more complicated. They're, they're, there's a little more overhead in in using them in in many cases, and so it's not that RSA was a bad choice. It just so happens back in the 70s they did not anticipate uh, quantum computers or what quantum computers could do. Yeah, and what year did Feynman first suggest the idea of a quantum computer? So or, do you yeah, remember? so Feynman famously uh, started talking about quantum computers, I believe, in 1981 or thereabouts. It was, but it was in the early, it was in the early eighties that people started talking about quantum computers, but even Feynman had no idea that it could be used for anything like this. Um, I think yeah. David Deutsch a few years later was the first person, as far as I'm aware, to talk about computers, not as, not as, not, not, not as, um, tools for simulation of physics, but as tools that could do you know, logical operations. And in fact, that there might exist algorithms for like logical algorithms that could be shortcuts compared to their classical counterparts. That was, I believe, first demonstrated in like a toy example by David Deutsch. And then it was another decade or so after that, 
before a useful algorithm that might actually be impactful on the real world was proposed. And that, of course, was Shor's algorithm. So that didn't happen until the mid 90s. And before that, people had people had no idea that quantum computers could do something like this. Wow. The the funny thing, um, this reminds me, speaking of coming up with very cool technology whose applications you don't really have in mind when you invent them. So I'm misremembering now, but there is a mathematician, and I'm, I'm embarrassed for not remembering their name, but a number theorist, maybe G.H. Hardy. Yes. Maybe not. Anyway, who was like, you know, priding himself on the fact that his research had no applications in the real world. And it was number theory, which is now the basis for cryptography, yeah, yeah, as you exactly. just described, exactly. <laughs> like, which is now, you know, causing problems with quantum computers. <laughs> no, no, I believe that it, I believe it was Hardy. Yeah. Was uh, it Hardy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a funny story. Yeah. Wow. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, Thank you, Stefan, for kind of going through like the, the basics of RSA and then talking about uh, what quantum computing is going to do to kind of change the playing field. Uh, one last question on that. Like, when is this? So this is going to happen in maybe 10 years, maybe, if, uh, if a quantum computer that can, can do this is in 10 years. How long is it going to take to rip RSA out of everything and put in this post-quantum cryptography protocols that you were talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the timeline for quantum computing... It's really hard to say exactly what the timeline is. 10 years is a number that a lot of people like to th throw around. Um, it could be, could be much sooner. It could be, could be five years. Uh, could be even less. That would be a little bit surprising, but it could be. Um, it could be 15. It could be 20. It could go the other way, too. When it comes to security, though, uh, what you have to do is think about like the probability that it might happen and what the potential uh, fallout of that event might be. So even if you think there's like a 1% chance that a quantum computer capable of breaking RSA will show up within the next 10 years, that's a 1% chance of like total disaster. So, uh, you know, you have to, you have to um, take precautions anyway, even if you're very pessimistic about quantum computers. I don't think anybody is equipped to say that quantum computers are impo that it's impossible for a quantum computer to show up within the next 10 years capable of breaking RSA. I don't right. well, I mean, and, that... and on top of that, like, are you, are we going to know? <laughs> like if, uh, if somebody does develop something like that, they're probably not going to necessarily, depending on who develops it, might not be screaming it from the, from the rooftops right away. That's true. That's true. You might not even know that it's happening by the time it happens. So, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry in this situation for a number of reasons. But, but to your other question in terms of like the timeline for, actually doing this uh, sort of migration or transition into a post-quantum cryptography world, it's going to take a similar amount of time. Um, these things are never easy. Part of the problem is that nobody really has an, a list or an inventory of all the places where RSA is currently being used that need to be switched out. Um, so you have to generate that inventory also. It's not the kind of thing that's, that's carefully tracked. Uh, and so, yeah, by the time all of our, you know, computers and devices are eventually, and the internet is eventually using uh, some kind of post-quantum cryptography, it's going to be a while. It's a, it's a, a decade-plus journey, I'm sure. Um, but for those kinds of critical, critical infrastructure-type uh, situations where it really matters... Um, that can get done. It can get done much faster, much faster with concerted effort, which is currently underway. Gotcha. Because we've been through this before. I'm trying to remember. Is it like SHA or something? I'm definitely yeah. not an expert with these things, but we've done migrations and they've taken. We have a, a history of things taking a long time. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. They always take a very long time, and um, and it, you can still find plenty of examples of long obsolete you know, broken cryptography being used all over the place. Uh, but so it's, it's the kind of work that's never really done, done. Uh, you sort of always have to be vigilant, but at least for those critical areas, the critical use cases, um, you can focus on that and get that done. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Ty Danae, do you have any, any last, uh, last questions for Stefan before we let him go? Yeah, maybe just to wrap up now. I mean, if imagine someone's listening to this episode, maybe they're a high school student or maybe they're 
um, even a professional in a different field. And it's very interesting in the spirit of spreading AQ awareness, AI and quantum tech awareness, which is one of the goals of this podcast. If someone wanted to, to help with this, you know, or they want to get their feet wet, or they say, this sounds like a really interesting career trajectory, how, how do I even get started? I mean, we mentioned mathematics, number theory, so there's some math background, there's some physics, there's even the engineering side of things, you know, entering this field of quantum computing on the applied side. I mean, do you have any thoughts or recommendations? If someone wants to jump in, where, where do you begin? What are some resources to access things to know? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. I think the, you know, there are many different ways that you can try and jump into this field. I think what we've been focusing on today, sort of the cryptography side and, you know, using uh, quantum computers for that kind of thing. I would say there's, a, there's, there are many uh, resources out there for learning cryptography, learning like basic, like the basics of that and the, you know, the math behind it and those kinds of things. I would, uh, I think there are plenty of, say, universities and Coursera and things like that that have those kinds of courses. On the quantum side, um, I would say to check out, you know, check out an introduction to quantum computing. And I think if you make it a goal to learn Shor's algorithm, uh, take a look at Shor's algorithm and then get to the point where you understand all the steps, you will be in a very good spot. Uh, Shor's algorithm is one of those things that before people learn it, even within, say, the physics community, or I say, especially within the physics community, it's one of those things that people know of it, but it's always perceived as like, oh, it's, it's complicated, but, uh, you know, um, whatever. The, um, it's actually not that complicated uh, once you sort of admit to yourself that it's possible to understand it. It actually is possible to understand it. And so I would say, take a look at Shor's algorithm. And if you understand the ins and outs of Shor's algorithm, you've automatically learned all kinds of stuff about like modular arithmetic, quantum computing, and different things like that. Excellent. So while folks take some time to investigate Shor's algorithm, maybe that'll give us some time to invite you back. And maybe we can chat about then or string theory. <laughs> or quantum gravity. Stefan, I think there's a lot for us to chat about on this podcast. All right. Well, I'm, I'm ready when you are. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> Great. again, Stefan. Let's do it. <laughs> we'll see you again Thank soon. You. Thanks. All right. Thank Take you. care. Bye. So maybe we should now, you know, one thing we asked Stefan, like, how do, what, where do we go from here if we want to learn more things? Um, maybe we should now suggest other resources. I mean, you mentioned you were doing some online studying. I mean, in your learning, have you, have you found any good places that have been helpful for you for learning about all these topics? Yeah, it's a bit, sometimes it's a bit of a struggle, honestly, and that's part of the reason why I'm really excited to be part of this podcast with you, this learning journey. Um, but there are some resources that really helped me uh, back when I was starting to do this about, about a year or so ago. Um, and some of them are just available for free online. So we'll put these in the show notes as well, but um, I'll give some, give some shout outs here on the, on the podcast. Uh, one is to Dominic Walliman. Um, he runs the Domain of Science YouTube channel, and he does all these videos where it's like the map of this and the map of that. And he has one called the map of quantum computing. It's like a half an hour long. And I don't know how many times I watched that when I first uh, knew that I was going to be working with, with Sandbox AQ. I think that's a really great resource to kind of get started. Um, and then after I got a little bit deeper into it, I went over to Quantum Country, which is another really great resource. It's free, and it's really more about um, understanding qubits, understanding quantum computing based on qubits. It's a little bit more on the mathy side. And I remember going through that course at the very beginning. It says you should know a little linear algebra, which it's been like forever since I've. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I ever took like officially took a linear algebra course in college. I don't think I did, but mm -hmm. I was like, I can handle this without linear algebra. It's fine. <laughs> and after yeah. like going through like a couple hours, I realized that no, they were right. <laughs> I need to get, a, get some linear algebra. So I went over uh, to Grant Sanderson, who um, has a channel called Three Blue, One Brown. And he has like an amazing linear algebra course. It's, I think it's maybe like 12 videos or something. Um, he used to work with, uh, with Khan Academy, he has a really great teaching style. And I watched a couple of those linear algebra videos. And then I went back to Quantum Country and um, things just like opened up for me. Um, and 
And so I, I really recommend uh, that sort of path and just like searching around and trying to see uh, see what other folks could, could find out there. Uh, what about you? Are there uh, videos or other resources that, that you've used before Tiny A that have helped you with this? Yeah, yeah. Plus one to everything that you said. Um, one thing I, I do want to recommend in particular about the RSA algorithm, which Stefan mentioned. So if folks are interested in kind of seeing a hands-on example or even going through that again or, you know, doing looking at some math while listening to, to that part of the podcast, I highly recommend um, – so there's a YouTube channel by Eddie Wu. So Eddie Wu is a mathematician, really great explainer. Um, there's a video, and we can put the link below. I think the title is The RSA Encryption Algorithm. Actually, there's part one and part two. Maybe they're less than 10 minutes long each, but it's just a really great, um, I think even targeted at the high school level. So if you want to see this kind of modular arithmetic in action, but not have to go through all of the math details and sort of the more formal aspects, but also seeing, you know, seeing the, the math worked out concretely. I highly recommend. It's really understandable. I thought it was just a great introduction. So Eddie, we would be sure to check that out. I think that's great. And I'd love to hear from all of our viewers that have made it this far and listeners that if, if yeah. you have found some resources, let us know. So uh, we've got our email address in the description here. Um, it's faqpodcast at sandboxaq.com. So you can let us know that way. You can make a comment um, down here in the, uh, the YouTube description or the YouTube comment section if you are watching on YouTube, or you can fill out a little review on whatever podcast, uh, audio podcast service that you're using and let us know what works for you. And while you're down there, let us know if you have any questions about any of the topics that came up today, any of those concepts, and we'll work to try to um, help you work through those. Um, and any topics that you'd like us to cover in the future, just drop a drop a comment down there and um, we'll do our best to try to um, have a, a whole podcast or at least part of a podcast um, used to address those those questions. Um, so yeah, that that would be great to get that kind of interaction. And um, I think that's I think that's probably it, Tide Do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Nope, I think that's it for today, and we will see everyone in two weeks.